Today's guest artist was born in Chicago and attended the School of the Art Institute of Chicago during the late 1960s, where the intrigue of great museums and the influence of Chicago's homegrown imagist pop art genre combined to set the stage for his signature figural fantasy art to emerge. Since that era, he has divided his time between studio pursuits and a variety of alternative employments, including carnival show painter, sideshow banner artist, professional muralist, museum curator, and educator. On this edition of Art Now, we'll look at the work of Glenn C. Davies. Hello, and welcome to Art Now, a program where we talk with artists whose work is part of our community. I'm John Morrison, and I'll be your host. Our guest today is Glenn C. Davies. How did you? Glenn. Glenn has lived in Champaign-Urbana since 1974. Glenn was born in Chicago and attended the School of the Art Institute of Chicago during the late 1960s. Glenn completed his BFA degree at Drake University in 1978, and he also received his MFA in painting from the U of I in 1981. Thanks, Glenn, for inviting us into your home today to discuss your work. My pleasure. Thank you for coming. Glenn, what can you tell us about how you became interested in being an artist? Well, I grew up uh, in the south suburbs of Chicago, and uh, it was the 1950s, and I lived in a very unique community, just a short train ride from Chicago, uh, less than an hour, and just a couple of blocks down the street was a big woods. So I, I felt right then there was a certain sense that I've continued to think about through my artwork as this sort of sense of dividing the world between the natural and the man-made and uh, pursuing uh, kind of an interest uh, along those lines. My father uh, was a commercial artist, had a studio in downtown Chicago, and my mother was also a fairly creative person and, and had interests in uh, all kinds of different folk art related things and crafts and my sister very creative as well. So I grew up in this creative home. We didn't have uh, a lot, but we had a lot of art materials because of, of that. And um, I was fortunate to, go, to be raised at a time when art education was kind of a burgeoning uh, field. And I had a, a very influential art teacher, John Wild, who was my grade school teacher and then went on to be my junior high school art teacher. And he was a very interesting guy, very uh, much treated us like adults, even as children. And I remember him, uh, he would take you aside and show you things that, uh, uh, about art that you would not normally be exposed to when you're a child, certain artists. And I remember specifically being exposed to this painting by um, Ivan Albright uh, called Into the World There Came a Soul Named Ida. Right. And I was so blown away by this painting that to this day I would, I would say that this was was one of the pivotal uh, moments uh, in establishing me as a young artist. Uh, and besides that, we also spent a lot of time in the museums in Chicago. My father would show at art fairs, and we would be at the 57th Street Art Fair in Hyde Park, just down the street from the Oriental Institute, and spent a lot of time in the Field Museum. And, and so I grew up with this great uh, appreciation for art and for museums and for a world of make-believe, which my parents were very uh, supportive of. And I always turned to art, always thought I would be an artist. The painting that you mentioned, the Albright painting, that's in the Art Institute, right? Right, right. right. Uh, what can you tell us about your life as a student at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago? Well, when I finally went there, I mean, I remember uh, specifically in my senior year trying to decide whether what area to go into, and I, I was very confused. I, I had got accepted by the School of the Art Institute, 
but um, I wasn't sure what field to go into. So I took a trip. It was actually my first trip away from home on my own with a good friend of mine. We went to the town of Galena, Illinois, and I took my camera along, and I took a bunch of pictures, and I thought, if these pictures come out, then I'm going to go into photography, because photography at that time was sort of a new art field in which many artists, uh, visual artists, painters, were using uh, photography. And so that's how it turned out. I, I became very devoted to photography, uh, and then eventually segued into filmmaking briefly, and, and finally settled on painting uh, uh, because of some of the teachers I met there, uh, the influence of the city. There was a very, there was a very um, strong urging of the Art Institute students to look at the city as your medium. The city itself was, was your school. This was all part of what formed a lot of the Harry Who artists and the images artists right. that I ended up really admiring and following in the footsteps of because uh, such people as uh, Ed Paschke and, and uh, Carl Worsom and Jim Nutt were s formerly students of the Art Institute and some of them had gone on to teach there. And so I was exposed to a lot of this and then of the, the gallery world, meeting these artists and then being exposed to the whole world of, of what it was to be a professional artist. Right. Well, you mentioned uh, coming in contact with some of the artists at the Art Institute. Were there any significant exhibits uh, that had occurred while you were there that maybe you feel had an impact on your artwork? Very much so. Uh, I remember uh, Ed Keenholz, who was a, a West Coast artist uh, who worked with assemblage art, had brought his famous piece, The Beanery, into the museum, right. and, and I would go every day. That was one of the advantages of being a student at the Art Institute, was you could go into the museum on a daily basis uh, another one was they, they put Red Groom's uh, assemblage uh, called uh, Ruckus Chicago, I City, believe. Right. And it had a, a gigantic Mayor Daly and a gigantic Hugh Hefner walking down Michigan Avenue in huge proportions. Right. And, and there was something about this phantasmagorical uh, kind of combination of objects and images that were so kind of off on the fringes of what was uh, really being looked at as contemporary art in, in New York. And I was very attracted to all this kind of comic-related and sensational kind of uh, imagery. Um, another one was the Dada and Surrealist exhibit. Uh, it's when I realized that Chicago had been such a huge supporter of Surrealism and Dadaism and had uh, a much larger collections of that than they did, say, the New York School of Art uh, works. So the exposure to that was very rich. And uh, finally, Ivan Albright, a return to my junior high school and, and grade school visit to, uh, into the world that came a soul named Ida to see the retrospective show of, of um, that artist and seeing Ivan Albright's works and all of his modeling uh, and models that he would use for his setups. Uh, again, hugely influential for me. Right. I remember some of those exhibits as a young man myself and they let, they had an impact on me as well. Well, can you tell us uh, a little about what came after your time at the Art Institute? What came next in your in your life? Well, I, I stopped going full-time and I was a part-time student and so still probably while I was segueing between part-time and leaving, uh, I, I had saved up my money and was going to take what I thought of as a pilgrimage to Europe and a true pilgrimage in the sense that I, I wanted to see Jan van Eyck's famous altarpiece painting in Ghent. And uh, my main crux of my trip was that. I was at that time carrying my fresh uh, sketchbook diaries, which I'll go into in some detail. But um, I, I decided to just document this trip, document my day-to-day -day experiences, and go to Ghent, see this altarpiece. Well, I sort of saw it and was awed by it. And then I was sort of, sort of thought, well, now what? What's I mean, I, next? I hadn't really planned what to do next <laughs> on my trip, but I ended up in Italy and spent a, a month traveling around there, and then came back to the U.S. Uh, spent started exploring into the world of the circus and the carnival, um, chiefly by going off and joining the circus uh, in 1973. Um, I, was, I had heard you could set up the big top and, and get a free admission, so I rode my bicycle out to the slot here as a 23-year-old, riding my little bicycle out there to the, to the lot, and 
uh, I was doing this heavy duty work, which was really exhausting. And the uh, owner of the show overheard me saying, I was a student at the Art Institute, and he asked me if I could paint a picture of a giant jungle rat chewing a man's leg off. And I said I thought I could do that. And I. You're that, training at the Art Institute. Exactly. I, I went home in a panic and found an old piece of plywood and quickly tried to paint a picture of a giant jungle rat, thought, well, this will do. And the next thing you know, I was traveling with the show. So that was a, quite an experience, and, and, I, and I can't even begin to explain it, although I will try a little later uh, to give you some more detail. Uh, what happened after that, I spent some more time on the road, I eventually lived in North Carolina for most of a year, and then I came to Champaign-Urbana, and I rented a huge studio because rents were very inexpensive back in the 70s. And it was having this huge studio that became a kind of a inspiration for doing larger work and uh, for probably doing some of the sideshow banner work I was exposed to when I traveled with the shows. Besides this, I also got some work uh, at a tent, or not at the tent and awning company, but at the sign painting shops and at a billboard company, which was in Champaign at that time. And I, from that experience, I probably learned more than in all my colleges combined right. through working in an actual shop where you had to enlarge work, work with lettering, work with images on a grand scale. And so if I roll that into my art education, I was feeling pretty good. And uh, from there, uh, I actually was able to work in my studio and start working on larger works. Great. Well, you mentioned your uh, sketchbook diaries um, when you were traveling through Europe. Um, is there anything more you could share with us about your sketchbook and its connection to your art? Yes. Um, the sketchbook became a very important thing. I, I had kind of floundered in, in my uh, art classes, and, and I kind of reached impasse at a certain point early in my art career where I didn't exactly know what direction to go in. I kind of stopped photography and stopped these other areas, and I found myself very confused. And the way I kind of brought myself out of it was that I decided I would make a complete drawing every day, and it would give me this sense of completion, something that I would actually feel I had accomplished that day. So it's what started off as being a drawing a day turned out to be sometimes several drawings a day. And the more comfortable I got with the medium, uh, I started just feeling like it was my constant companion and through the use of it on a daily basis, I was able to kind of form a personal visual language made up of metaphors and symbols and objects that was my way of using visual shorthand. Uh, and I could translate what was happening to me on a daily basis um, through these icons and images that I would combine to sort of um, abbreviate the story. Uh, right. I brought along a sketchbook just to show you. I would fill, uh, I, I probably have a dozen or, or more of these. Uh, just each day, one, two, three, or four of these, what I thought of as finished drawings. They right. were, uh, they had uh, no cross hatching involved. They were right. all done with kind of a technique that imitated um, printmaking techniques. Uh, and used uh, little dashes and dots to right. represent uh, the way you would fill in shadowed forms. And I became so fluent at doing this, and I continue to this day, really, using this technique, that this became the foundation. Uh, and I felt that I, that I could enter a particular private world that I had invented through these drawings. And when I would, would produce them, I guess I kept in mind trying to tell a story that would also be... Uh, that anyone looking at it could find some element or object within there that they could identify with and, 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 and feel like that they had their own interpretation. Right. Well, you, you mentioned traveling with the circus and the carnival. Um, is there anything specifically about the time that you spent with them that you feel is a direct influence on your artwork? Well, yes. I mean, the entire experience of traveling with the circus especially. The circus and the carnival are very different. The circus is something that comes to a town on a single day, appears overnight, uh, the tent is erected like a mushroom, uh, it disappears that night, and the next day there's nothing to see of it. 
Uh, whereas the carnival, you're set up for a week or two oh, and, and, and you get down kind of into the community more. So there was a very magical aspect to this. These were the days when the tent was still made out of canvas uh, and the show was pretty uh, ragtag kind of operation. Uh, I had to share the back sleeping quarters with a chimpanzee. Uh, these are all things that you probably wouldn't happen nowadays, and, and I, you know, uh, I experienced so many different things. I had to be painting this giant jungle rat exhibit while, uh, you know, tearing up and, and, and setting up every day, uh, and I'd put in my hours, and, and then I would have time to go see the afternoon show, see the evening show, got to know all the performers, got to know all the different acts, and, and, and then you'd wake up and you, you would find yourself in a new town, and set up in the same way, but there was this sense that you know you were carrying on a tradition that had been going on for hundreds of years, uh, and so there was something very interesting about that. The music got into your soul, uh -huh. the visuals, the people, and this became great fodder for my own uh, art. Okay. I well uh, because around that same time I traveled with carnivals, and carnivals right. being a different thing, I saw truly large sideshows, and the sideshows. The thing that intrigued me a lot about them was initially what was out front, the sideshow banners, these large painted canvas banners uh, displaying the uh, what was going to be going on inside of a unique the genre area. of art. Exactly, right. and and I started to meet the show painters and the uh, banner artists who were doing this work, and this really got to me. I mean, I, this seemed like something that I'd always wanted to be a part of. And from that point on, I thought I would try to adapt either certain aspects of that in my own work to my own work, or else I also thought and eventually did start painting banners uh, for sideshows. Right. Well, when you were traveling with the circus, at least they didn't ask you to share quarters with the giant jungle rat. That's that, true. <laughs> should look on the bright side. Well, it, it, that is a very good point. That... What you just talked about probably is a good segue into my next question, and that is that I've noticed that many of your paintings are done on free hanging canvas banners. Can you tell us more about that choice? Okay, well that was uh, early on when I had first uh, moved into my big studio in Champaign. I thought, well, I'm going to try to be a banner artist, and I couldn't, I didn't even know where to get the equipment. I remember going out and buying kind of paraffin covered Camping tarps. That You're I, still doing paintings. Oh on yes, I still. I, I've continued to use this format. Um, uh, and initially, it was out of poverty and convenience that I was able to find these <laughs> these paraffin soaked uh, things. But I painted on them, and some of those paintings still exist and, and still survive. Uh, eventually, I learned uh, how to purchase the other types of materials, or have tent and awning companies stitch it up for you. Right and. Uh, over the years, I've continued to use this format for a number of reasons. Number one of which is extremely convenient to be able to roll up an entire exhibit's worth of work into three or four tubes and send it where you're going to send it. Like and the carnival or like, the circus. That's well, what they, they would have just folded it up and thrown it in the they back of the truck. They would have folded them. Oh, yeah. They, they oh, folded my. them. Uh, and you could fold these. It's just that you'll see the fold marks more. Uh, and I was afraid I, I would, didn't want the, my own paint to get... Uh, cracked or, or the surface to be marred in any way but but rolling it was very easy and it would save a lot of money in terms of doing these shows uh, as a convenience but I also liked the aspect of that these banners resembled something more like you would carry in a church processional or in a lodge meeting or in a parade they had a certain kind of uh, casualness to like them a ceremonial or, or a ceremonial kind of meeting as well. So these two things, these kind of things that crossed over, two areas that I'm very interested in, the sacred and the profane, the idea of the carnival followed by Lent, the idea of the religious rituals and then the carnival rituals. So I tried to find things in my own work and in creating uh, these banner formats, I thought it kind of put it in the right context to tell the kinds of moral tales and, uh, and, and moral dilemmas that I was trying to uh, address in my paintings. Okay. Well, it almost sounds like some of what you were getting in there are part of my next question, and that is, uh, are there common themes or underlying concerns that your work deals with? Well, very much. Um, early on, when I was trying to develop the style of painting that I work in, 
I was very interested in the character of every man, which I think was came from a morality play back in the fifteenth uh, century uh, or earlier, uh, dealing with very much what it means to be an every man, a common person. But usually those were were dealing with with kind of a stupendous and and uh, awful dilemmas that would overcome this person on their way of life, on their journey through life. And oftentimes these were addressed at moral issues uh, that were answered through uh, religious uh, kinds of, uh, you know, answers for, for each of these things. So I decided I was going to make more of an everyman character that was more secular, more humanist, and in some ways was a, a, an alter ego to my own exploration for uh, the kinds of pitfalls that one finds in life. And, and I, so I started creating these things. I uh, even made some um, what I called altars, uh, which used the word altar to mean something that could be changed rather than the religious term right. for an altar. And I would make articulated puppet figures that could be moved into different positions uh, to tell stories. Another typical topic I would use would be uh, vanity. The idea of, of, of the, well, for instance, I, I commonly use the Tower of Babel as a symbol, and I, I use that as a symbol to represent vanity. The idea that we try to reach a spiritual plane by physical means rather than by spiritual means, and, and as told right. in the Bible, I, I thought this uh, sample itself, the exact ziggurat itself, was a fascinating symbol. It was also kind of reverse. If you kind of smashed a ziggurat down, you would have a kind of vortex shape. Right. And this vortex shape is something I commonly use in my own paintings in the skies to represent the kind of idea of spirituality or, or the upper world. And the, the structure of the, of the uh, ziggurat right. is more of the lower world, the physical world. I also use uh, moments of mystery, and I use colloquial phrases such as the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak, or rising to the occasion. I will often use these to, to tell a story that has a, a sort of moral tale. Um, I, I use uh, flying heads, for example. In, in some of my rising to the occasions, if people have made a mistake, I mean there'll be a head, it looks like a sort of a severed head, there might be flames or something shooting out of the back of it, it'll be flying up into the sky, and people will say, oh, boy, you must really like those Texas Chainsaw Massacre, mo <laughs> massacre movies, and I say, no, I, I, I don't, I mean, uh, this is really about the idea of trying to reach a more spiritual plane, the idea of the head being the 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 world of thought, the world of wonder, the world of pursuing, and that it's it's flying up there, and your body is the physical form below. So it was an idea of, of trying to tell stories about the spiritual and the physical. Well, you mentioned the flying heads and the ziggurats. Uh, uh, when one looks at your work, you can't help but notice a number of reoccurring objects or symbols in your paintings, uh, towers coffee cups, palm trees, spirals, martini glasses, sharks, snakes, stars, and ladders, and flames, just to list a few. Is there anything more you can, you can share with us about this lexicon of, of symbols that you infuse your work with? Well, a lot of them are, should be semi-obvious. I mean, flames are flames. I mean, I use clouds and flames. I use symbols that represent the sky, the starry sky, right. the, the sky lit by fireworks, the idea of, uh, I think the idea of the expansive sky came to me in travels in the southwest, observing the skies at night and realizing there was nothing closer to this sense of spiritual awakeness than to see these, these kinds of amazing skies. So I use them in my paintings. I also use words and symbols that I draw as constellations within the sky. I use sharks to represent the threat, uh, and maybe snakes as well, the threat of uh, the upper and lower world, something that breaks the water but has the, the fin showing, and something like the uh, snake which lives above the ground and below the ground. So in this way I'm able to, you know, coffee cups started to represent uh, daytime, Martini glasses represented nighttime, <laughs> so right. I, would, I would represent the t passing of time. Okay. Um, would you say that your work has evolved or changed much over the years? And if so, how? 
Well, it has changed only in the sense, I mean, I'm still telling a, a story, and I'm still telling some of the same stories that I was interested in then. Some of them have changed because of my uh, age. Uh, as you get older, as you experience some of the things that were your hopes and dreams, and, and uh, you, you move on, you move on to new kinds of areas that, that interest you. And, and telling that maybe in a slightly different manner, or using it in, a, in with different kind of color, different types of forms. Okay. I've noticed that your most recent work, and we have a couple of examples here, uh, you have added a collage element on top of your drawings. What can you tell us about that? Well, a good example of my drawings, I mean, I, I became very, you know, very, it came easy for me to do the kind of drawings I did. And the easier it became, it also became harder and harder to resolve the drawings because it seemed like there was a long, long process of, it became very um, tedious, I should say. And the tediousness brought along a kind of, uh, just, I didn't want to follow through. And so I realized I had used collage in some ways for a while in greeting cards and in special uh, gifts for people. But I started mining old uh, late 19th century, early 20th century chromolithograph books and finding these, these common kind of everyday images that people collected. And by gluing them on or, or assembling them in some fashion into the picture, it seemed like it brought it to life because it created new challenges. How can I incorporate this object? How can I incorporate these various cutouts into making the piece tell uh, a more interesting story? And it has continued to work, and now I've been working on these for a couple of years, and I, and I continue to be intrigued with this process. And it, I, I had done assemblage sculpture before, and, and I was interested in that, but doing it with this new uh, material made it more interesting for me. All right. Well, thanks again, Glenn, for this opportunity to learn more about you and your art. Our guest today has been Glenn Davies. You can see more of Glenn's work on his website, at glenncdavies.com, no spaces of course, and locally at the Cinema Gallery in downtown Urbana. And I hope you have enjoyed this edition of Art Now and that it may inspire you to explore our local art scene and to perhaps even make your own art now.